Um, it's such a thrill to see you all here today. And um, I'm so happy that this has been an incredible team work to bring this about. And it's just wonderful to see you all here. Anyway, my task is just to introduce our uh, first keynote speaker. And uh, many months ago, we had a meeting with the forum partners at which we discussed what kind of keynote speakers do we want. And we brainstormed a bit together and came up with a long list of qualities that we were looking for. Um, we said, we want charismatic people. We want leaders in their field. We want intellectual visionaries, gifted speakers. Oh, and they need to come from outside cultural heritage conservation. So they're completely new, inspiring voices to us. This last point is actually quite crucial because it was the consideration of the forum partners that we need to look beyond our sector to gain fresh perspectives and insights to set the broader context to our conversations over the next three days. Um, to be honest, it seemed a bit of a tall order. Um, but I think, actually, in the selection of the speakers we'll hear from, we did a good job. And in particular, it's my very great pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker to kickstart this forum, Mrs. Lydia Brito. Brito, excuse me. <laughs> The uh, international context can be quite challenging sometimes. Um, anyway, Lydia Brito is the director of the Division of Science Policy and Capacity Building at UNESCO. Uh, I should just say a few words about her background. She's born in Mozambique, uh, and she has a, a first specialism in uh, wood science and. Um, her areas of expertise range from forestry and sustainable management of natural resources to higher education and, in particular, policy development for science and technology as part of public policies for sustainable development. We're very honored to have her here with us, as I think there is no one better place, really, to tell us globally what is happening in the field of science and what strategic movements are being made, or perhaps should be made, in the sphere of science policy development. I must also say that Lydia has been the most conscientious of keynote speakers, crafting her talk to match the purpose of this meeting. And we're really very grateful to her for her thought and consideration that she's put into preparing her talk today. And I hope very much that you will enjoy listening to what she has to say. Uh, thank you, thank you, and good morning to all, and thank you, Alison. Uh, I have to say that uh, when I was invited and I went to see really what the forum was about, uh, I felt that I was not the right speaker. Uh, and, uh, and then we had to exchange some ideas, and then I understood that it uh, would be interesting to, to share with you how we see uh, global trends in science, technology, and innovation, and how some of those trends could become opportunities uh, for science, for, for conservation. Uh, but the real reason I really decided to, let's go for it, it's because it's a field that I don't know. Although I work with uh, natural science, we do science policy for natural science, we do capacity building in natural science. In UNESCO, we have, of course, our culture sector, very strong sector. We never thought of working together and doing capacity building programs between the natural science sector and the culture sector. Uh, and I felt that, uh, that uh, the opportunity to, to spend time with you, at least today, uh, would give me a little bit of background that I can bring home uh, and say to my colleagues in, in the culture se sector, let's do something together because there is a growing field uh, that is important for us in natural science, is important for, for culture, let's work together. So I'm really honored to be here and really thank you to the organizers for inviting me and to give me this opportunity uh, to learn a little bit about what are the huge concerns that your field is facing and how can we at UNESCO uh, really respond a little bit better to, to the needs of, of this sector. 
and I was doing my homework and going through the surveys and uh, the brainstorm reports and the abstracts, uh, and I saw that, for instance, capacity building is one of the concerns. Uh, another one is sustainability and so on. So I will try to, in this first talk, to, to raise some of these, these trends and then uh, we can see in the discussion uh, what more can be said about this. Uh, but allow me to, to start by, by framing us. Where are we living and what kind of world do we have today? Uh, because if we want to look at the future, we need to know where we are, where we come from, uh, in order to, to act today, in order to dream the future. Uh, and the first, uh, the first characteristic of our world is clear globalization. And we can see from the, 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 the diversity of nationalities, of countries, of professions, uh, but also the web streaming and all, uh, you know, these technologies that allow us really uh, to be in real time in contact with people anywhere in the world. But that has a huge implication. It means that local decisions have global impacts and global decisions have local impacts. And therefore, we can see each other just isolated. And this is also true for, for science fields. Whatever we do, whatever path we follow, it's going to impact others, and we have to be uh, definitely uh, in tune with that. The second characteristic, it's uncertainty. We are living more and more in an uncertain world, and we can see now with natural disasters, when man-made man disasters, we never know what is going to eat us next, and a lot of times this is not really very good uncertainty. Sometimes there are some good things, good news, good surprises, but in many ways it, they are not that good. But the huge problem about this is that all our education system, our decision-making systems, they are made to be certain. We are trained to be certain about something. That's how we educate our young people. They have to be certain that this is the way to go. They have to be certain that this is the truth. But today, even our models, our predictions, are not certain anymore. We don't have uh, the capacity now to really predict what is coming, to anticipate what is coming. And therefore, this has huge implications for education, but also for research. Because it means that research will have to deal with uncertain uh, uh, aspects. We also live under pressure, and, 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 and population is a very good example of one of the drivers of that pressure in the planet. Uh, and, and, and therefore, we have to think, I mean, uh, with the rate of growing of our population, with the rate of urbanization that we are seeing, the mega cities and so on, uh, everything is going to change because we need to think of ways of living uh, that, uh, that, that are different from the ones we, we have today. Uh, I was just saying someone that the, uh, when I came in holidays four years ago with my daughters, we went to this uh, city, uh, port city near, near Rome, Ortia, Ortia, Ostia, Ostia. And I was impressed that at that time we could already see the uh, planning the, for a city, like we know it today. And it was done, I don't know, many centuries before. Uh, but that kind of city probably has to change because we can't anymore afford with the number of people living in cities today to have the kinds of cities we have now. So there is a lot of, 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 of uh, issues related to pressure. But we also have to realize that we live in the poor world and sometimes we forget because although there, is, there are many countries getting richer, others getting out of poverty, when we look at the people, we are still a very poor world, and a lot of our people live uh, with less than one, one dollar a day. A and therefore, when we discuss sustainability, we have to discuss poverty, because it's not possible to be sustainable when you have poor people. And that's probably the biggest challenge we have as humanity. And also inequalities, and I will discuss a little bit when I discuss the trends. So we are still living in a world that is very unequal. And, and this, of course, puts not only ethic issues, uh, but also about capacity building, because a lot of these inequalities come from lack of access to education, to health, and so on. And how can we solve uh, these inequalities uh, that are still characterizing strongly 
uh, our world and, and therefore creating these pockets of poverty, it's creating conflict, it's creating demotivation, it's creating uh, you know, waste of resources, in particular capital, uh, human capital. Because if we don't use our human capital in full and allow me to, to bring the gender issue, uh, for instance, if we don't use the, the, the female uh, population and educate them and make sure that they have the same opportunities as the other half of the population, we are wasting 50% of our human capital. And that is true for young uh, children that don't have access to education and, and, and so on and so on. So issues of inequality are also quite, quite uh, complicated. So our world today, it's an interesting one. It, it does have a lot of challenges, but all these issues can be seen as also opportunities. This is our world in Jena, but how is the science, the technology, and the innovation landscape changing? And I'm going to use something that is a, real, a, a little bit old in the sense that we are already starting to produce the next one. I'm going to use the trends that we, we discovered when we uh, produced the UNESCO science report in 2010. The next one will be 2015, and we are already uh, in the mood of starting to prepare that, that, uh, that report. It takes basically two and a half years uh, to prepare such a comprehensive report. And, uh, but what was interesting in this, uh, in this uh, 2010 report is that things that we were already anticipating became very clear. The first one is because there was a cycle of economical growth, there was a lot of investment in research and development. And that was very good news uh, for us because we really uh, got an increase of expenditure in research and development by 45%. And that was never seen in a period of five years. These reports are published every five years and, and this was a huge, huge uh, increase. Uh, of course, there were changes. The global intensity remained more or less the same. For instance, in Brazil, that had a quite good economic boom, the intensity uh, progressed much slower than the economy. But in general, there was a huge uh, growth in the expenditure for research and, and, and development. And in effect, this was also the time where we saw basically all the countries starting to talk about science, technology, and innovation policy frameworks and instruments. And in effect, my division became very busy because suddenly we had countries all over the world asking us, can you work with us in revising, uh, revising uh, designing, implementing our science policies? But the important uh, uh, role here was the Asian impact. During these five years, it was really Asian countries that made, made these numbers change. It was China with a huge growth, it was India, it was Korea, South Korea. So these were what we call the, 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 the Asian uh, giants and the new powerhouses in science. They really changed the landscape of expenditure. And of course, this had a lot of impacts, and I will discuss another trend later, that was they start being an iman for researchers. Before, you would see researchers from the south start coming to the north and to the US, trying to get a job, a good lab research, good funding, and the fact that they are starting to become the powerhouses, we are seeing now a different trend. It's still an initial one, but now we see researchers from Europe, from the US, starting to go south because there they have better conditions, they have more funding uh, for research, uh, and so on and so on. And this, of course, has a lot of implications, not only for, for, for the positive implications for the countries receiving this this human capital, but it will have implications, of course, for European and, and North American institutions. But although there are good news, the thing is inequalities are still there. So science and technology are still being owned by very few countries. If we count the big fives, I'm coming from Africa, so we, we talk about big fives in terms of wildlife, but this is the big fives in science. China, European Union, Japan, Russia Federation, US. They are the five 
that are really producing most of the, the new knowledge and technology. They only have one third of the world population, but they do, they have three quarters of the researchers of the world are in these five countries. And the expenditure in research and development, are, three thirds are in these countries. So clearly you can see that there are quite a lot of inequalities and there are still countries that are not able to produce knowledge. But what is also important to look is that these differences are not only between countries, but within countries. For instance, South Africa, a country very near mine, you know, most of the research is done in Johannesburg uh, uh, area, what we call the Gauteng province. 51% of R&D expenditures are in this province. The same in Brazil with Sao Paulo. You know, the same with the US. You know, California has one-fifth of, of the expenditure uh, of the whole country. Ten states have, you know, the majority of R&D efforts in the states, out of 50. So you have not only differences between countries, but also within countries. And so this reinforces, in a way, this inequality and also this inability to really mobilize all the capacity, all the innovation, all the creativity that exists in the rest uh, uh, of, of the country, of, 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 of the regions. Another interesting trend, and I apologize, it's a little bit heavy slide, you don't have to read it all, uh, but really science is becoming more democratic. And one of the reasons, and again this morning we were talking about this ability of people following up what we are saying here, just by using the web stream. You know, the internet really democratized science. And, and, and for us, this is a very good, good uh, uh, movement uh, because it means that people have access to knowledge in a way they never had before. And you see more and more academic institutions promoting open uh, source uh, materials. And, and so this brings the voices of the voiceless also to the debate. And, and I think social media, it's a huge, a huge uh, advance uh, for science, for the democratization uh, of science. Uh, the same with the mobile telephony. I don't have the numbers here. But again, it's something that allows people to communicate to each other, but also to access services that can be knowledge-based or science-based. And, and this is very important. In Africa, for instance, in Kenya, we have this, this uh, the platform for the mobile services, not only for the finance, that's fine, but also for health care, for public health care. If there is a pandemic, if uh, you are a mother with a young child, you have access to knowledge uh, and to information how to take good care of your children. And, and I think these this technologies become, uh, makes uh, knowledge much more uh, accessible. Also the fact, uh, that, that these, uh, these technologies make this knowledge, these technologies accessible, you see countries that have less research capacity being able to leapfrog because they can acquire the knowledge and the, the, the technologies and, and therefore innovate in their processes. But most interesting is that because the big fives are changing and we have emerging powerhouses, the rules are changing. And rules not only how you do science, but how do you trade the results of science? How do you protect the results of science? So you start having a much more demo democratic debate, even in, in intellectual property rights and in trade agreements uh, and, uh, and so on and so on. And, and that's very good because it means that we are opening up the sector uh, and, and, and bringing more, more capacity to it. Uh, another movement that is also linked to the democratization of science is that you see uh, more countries investing in science, uh, popularization of science. So you see media involved. That was another thing that I was struck in, in your reports. Very little media coverage. I would say that your area is such an interesting area. It's so beautiful that media would, would catch uh, but, but apparently you don't work that well with media. Uh, but we are doing that more and more in science. Through the science centers, through the science museums, 
uh, with the scientific journalists, we are really bringing science to the day-to-day -day lives of people. And that is really a culture of science that you need if people have to take the right decisions and have to defend uh, science investments uh, in their countries. Uh, finally, the other trend is the internationalization of science. And I said that I was going to, to speak a little bit about that. Uh, clearly, the internet has, a, uh, has, has bring that, but I think the cost of mega projects, no country alone can today get these huge facilities that are needed for some of the observations and from some of the research. So it is becoming normal that when you have to bring and to build these huge research facilities, you basically do consources, international consources, where you bring several, several partners from different parts of the world to build this common fac uh, facility. Uh, also multinationals, they have played an enormous role in internationalizing science because they need to put their research uh, hubs elsewhere in the world uh, and, and because it's important for them. And, and that has bring, you know, new different kinds of researchers uh, from different ways coming in. Also on the private sector, and that's why hopefully on the 2015 we are, want to do a chapter on the report on the impact of private firms in the landscape of STI. For instance, the takeovers, uh, when the, a company takes over another company, it's amazing. They don't acquire just the name. They acquire the patents, they acquire the researchers, they acquire... And, and what we are seeing is when South companies are starting, starting to buy North companies, they get all this wealth of knowledge that, was, that they didn't edit before. So the takeover sometimes is not just because that company is it's, uh, rentable or is good to have. No, most of the time is because of the patents they have and what kind of research teams they have. That's why you buy today a company. It's not so much for the brand and, and, and so on, but it's really the, the human capital and the knowledge capital that that company uh, that you want to buy has. And that's how you decide if you go for it or not. So, so really, this, these two ways, transfer of information, of knowledge, of people, it, it's really making uh, research collaboration much stronger, but also a much more competitive environment. So t today you are not sure if you get the best of the, the best, because you have many other countries competing with you. So this is how science is changing, and we are seeing that some of these trends are really uh, becoming even stronger. But let's now see from a perspective of science, if we have this world that is global, uh, globalized, pressurized, uncertain, uh, unequal, poor, what can science do? when we have already some global trends that are forcing us somehow to think together. Uh, and when we had the Planet Under Pressure meeting in London in preparation for Rio Plus 20, uh, clearly what became uh, very, very strong was the need for a new approach to research, a more integrative uh, 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 process, more international, solution-oriented, a link between research questions to challenge in development, uh, and these inter interdisciplinarity efforts. And again, I saw many of uh, abstracts uh, raising this issue. Also, the idea that, uh, that we need, the, in the post-2015 agenda, we need goals that are related to global sustainability, but they are also based in scientific evidence not just goals that are based in political uh, statements, but really that science needs to inform uh, the definition of the goals, the, 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 the setting of targets, the, the identification of the right indicators. And that puts a lot of pressure on the scientific community global-wise. And also the need for new mechanisms to have this science policy interface. And, and, and I think this is something that uh, uh, that again, it came out in your, in your, in your uh, abstract. A and that's why we are today talking about a different paradigm. We are seeing already a shift of paradigm in how knowledge is produced. 
We went from this linear model where science was the endless frontier and it was the quest for new knowledge that push the research communities to a new social contract where science is really responding to the major global challenges that we are facing as humanity. <clears throat> and, and, and really, it, it's, it's that transformation, it's that shift of paradigm that is forcing the research communities to integrate and to start doing projects that are uh, you know, transdisciplinary and that are linked to questions that go beyond the science questions, but really questions that are related to global sustainability. <clears throat> and, and, and this happening, it's not something that is in the pipeline, it's already happening. The sad story is that the inequalities that we had before, when science was, the, uh, was an endless frontier, we still have the same kind of inequalities when we talk about sustainability science. So this puts a lot of pressure on us to create the capacity building that we need in regions of the world that are not doing yet or utilizing yet this kind of science approach. So to respond to changing, this changing landscape from a perspective of science and from a perspective of the planet and human society, <coughs> we need to address the core science questions in a different way. And this means to involve stakeholders. It means co-design. You have to co-design research programs so that the results of that, the, the, that program can indeed benefit the stakeholders that need most. So co-design and co-production is becoming a mode on the sustainability science paradigm. Uh, also a different approach, more integrative, international, solution oriented. Uh, our moderator said, don't think about pro problems, think about solutions. Well, science is trying to do the same, solution oriented. Can we come up with solutions? Uh, and, and so international collaboration in the region and among regions become very important. Also the governance issues and the policy frameworks, they have to change. The, the SDI policies, they cannot be any more top down. Ivory Tower, no, no, they are basilar, they are structural. They build the blocks that other public policies need. They build the human capacity. They bring the knowledge. They create the innovation in the productive sector. They build in the society the understanding of science. And therefore, they support the other public policies. To do science policies today as the top going down and say you do this, you do this, it's not going to work in the, in, where we are living. So it means to shift also the way we do the frameworks uh, and also how we build on the monitoring systems. And of course we need to embed science, uh, science evidence in decision making and the institutional setups have to change. You don't see anymore a department that is closed on itself. It's not possible anymore. What you see is teams, you core projects that bring departments together and they approach uh, research in, a, in an integrated way. You see industry coming in, you see government coming in, you see society coming in. So it's really, really, really changing. Uh, we have a, a major scientific initiative uh, called Future Earth that is trying to, to really build on this. It's a 10-year initiative trying to, to, to see all these opportunities uh, and make it uh, really work. Uh, and, and, and basically the idea is to, to, to support governments and societies to move to global sustainability, better forecasting and, and, and observation of risks, response strategies and innovation paths to what's coming, and of course fill some critical knowledge gaps. So if you need to know more, we have a website on, on the Future Earth Initiative. It's a quite interesting uh, initiative. Uh, but more than ever, we need to build bridges, dialogues, partnerships to strengthen uh, STI governance and the advice mechanisms. How can really science influence decision making? Uh, because we, we live in a polar world. Uh, 
Governments have short-term agendas, but we need long-term vision in order to really design our, our, our long-term research programs. They want certainty, but we live in uncertainty. Uh, we have disciplines, they are all there, but we need to have this transdisciplinary, multidisciplinary uh, approach to science. There are a lot of known connections that we always will use when we want to influence decision making, but most of the time it's the hidden connections that arrive faster with the, the message. So if we want to get the right message, we also need to understand what are these hidden connections uh, that link policymakers to their decisions. Economic interests versus societal interests, environmental interests, language objectives versus how science looks at that, the individual and coalition power versus citizen solutions. So this is where we are working and these are the issues that we need to address when we want to bring science to the decision-making process, be it in governments, be it in society, be it in industry. And the problem is that most of the time we have an opportunistic approach. If there is a disaster, they will call the scientists to say, well, how can we deal with this? Can we predict? Do you think this is going to happen? But there is not really a constant dialogue and interface between science, policy, and society. So I joke that in UNESCO, the S is science, of course, we do science, but it's also society. So really the meaning of the S has a double meaning. It has to be science, but it also has to be society. Because if you don't bring to the interface also society, you can't have this long-term synergetic dialogue, conversation between the different, different, uh, different actors. And therefore, the science evidence is always arriving too late. <clears throat> And, and, and for me, this is what I call the society-centered approach. It means to recognize the importance of bringing the citizens to the scientific processes in a more meaningful way, empower them to really follow and to gather knowledge and to bring their knowledge, and, and really having a full engagement of society. It's not only science for society, but it's also society for science. And I think in the your area of work, this is a very important dialogue that you really need to have society very near what you do and what are the major issues that you, you face. Uh, so basically we need a cross-scale intervention, so we need interfaces that go across scale, go from local to national to regional. You need to bring the different stakeholders, not always easy. Uh, embedding science evidence in the processes not on the decision, because when is the decision, sometimes it's too late or it's too early. But when the decision-making processes, they themselves take science evidence as, as part of the process, then we are in a, better, in a better possibility. The issue of building capacities, really very important. You need to have voices and faces. You have to multiply the faces and amplify the voices because otherwise it's reducing, reducing, reducing. So this is a, a major, major challenge for research communities how to uh, increase uh, the capacity that we have. Communication sal uh, challenges, issues covered, whose question and time scale it's ours as researchers, it's the society, it's the practitioners, it's the beneficiaries. How to keep questions alive? And I think these are quite important things. Very quickly, uh, what we did in our division uh, by using uh, uh, space technology, specifically linked to World Heritage Sites. Uh, the first was trying to, to, to we did this, this exhibition, uh, trying to see uh, how climate change was affecting uh, some of our most uh, prestigious um, uh, world heritage sites. And we had quite a lot of, of partners, and we showed this in many, many places of the world. Uh, and, and because it was so graphic, uh, 
people really understood, yes, we have a problem here and something has to be done. And I think this is one of the technologies that at least for large uh, World Heritage sites can be very important. Based on that, we decided to do what we call the uh, image atlas of World Heritage sites on the danger lists. There are 31 sites all, all over the place that are in danger. So we use, based on the exhibition, we decided to do uh, with our partner, the, the United States Geological Survey, to do these atlas that show the sites that are in danger and why are they in danger. And, and, and this again became a very interesting uh, uh, policy tool to discuss with governments because they can see what's happening there. Another interesting project is modeling and reconnecting the Silk, uh, silk Route. It's such a long route, so many countries, uh, difficult areas to go, uh, that this technology is really helping us uh, with our partners to really uh, develop heritage information and, and a management system for this very important uh, uh, world heritage. Also, uh, the inventory of preservations of frozen tombs in the mountains of Altai, uh, because they are threatened by the loss of uh, peramost frost, uh, frost. So we use this technology to, to monitor and to make sure that, uh, that, uh, that the tombs are protected. We have many other, other uh, space projects, and some of them are related to schools how to enthusiastic young students to technology in one hand, but also to cultural heritage in another hand. So this is an area that, like I was saying, that I hope after being with you here and being invited and going through all your papers, uh, I'm really excited and I hope that my colleagues in culture will, will uh, have the same excitement that we can do things together, precisely in this area of science education, but bringing this cultural aspect uh, that, uh, that I think is fundamental. Finally, I really believe that it's all about leadership. We can do so much, but if you don't feel passionate about that, if you are not a leader that can push it to a different level, it's not going to work. So we need to anticipate, and I think the format of this forum is very much on that direction anticipate engagement, stimulate questioning. Don't be afraid that there are no answers. Just keep the question alive because that will bring and engage others to, to really make things work. It's really about creativity, innovation, transdisciplinarity, entrepreneurship, networking, partnership. And I think you have it all in the set of this, this forum. I thank you very much.